Okay. Now, now we've clean started. See, I started twice because I didn't like the first start. Didn't like That's how we do things on Funny Book Forensics. We let you know the insides and outs, sides, and yes, the all and what's outsides. in between. In between? In the between cabbage. Inside. <laughs> in the spaghetti. What? There's no spaghetti in cabbage. I don't know what I'm talking about. It's like we're layered. No, I was going to go where like layered, like cabbage or Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts. Those are layered. I brought, I bought Brussels sprouts the other day. I'm delicious. sure that's what every listener wanted to know, is that you bought bru- well, Brussels sprouts. I bought them so I could cook them in the new air fryer. I mean, like, that's, I know you're excited about that. The I listeners to, are. Got my grandma a new air fryer. And that's like, she wanted to cook sweet potatoes, Brussels sprouts, and the white broccoli, which is cauliflower. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, there you go. See, it's like a, it's like a Christmas meal. Yeah. Because we're talking about christmas with the superheroes whoa what i said i would go find something from the archive and boy did i you did you delivered dan just like santa i don't know i mean by the time we're done reviewing this i don't know if everybody will agree that i delivered here but (laughs) i definitely uh i definitely pulled out a tabloid that i have called limited collector's edition presents by dc comics it's number C-43, if anybody's curious. That's Collector-43. Now, these tabloids came in a couple of different names. So this one is Limited Collector's Edition. There were a couple of different names they would throw on top the tabloids. But the tabloids were, this is not one of the more famous ones. This is not Muhammad Ali fighting Superman. No. But, I mean, you got a, I mean, a, a giant cast of characters in this book. And we do your normal, like, collected stories together. Yeah, it's well, it's, it seems like an odd set, right? Uh, but it is a yeah, and the, the with cl- a lot of collector's edition, they would pull together older stories. Uh, one of the more famous one was like the the Flash Superman tabloid, right? The race, which came oh, from yeah. an issue, but got republished into the tabloid. And, every, mm-hmm. you know, it was a huge deal. Um, some of them were not collector's editions is that they had actually original stories. Like there are two big Legion of Superheroes ones that I have that were original stories. In fact, one was super famous because Mike Grell left. We've mentioned this on the podcast before. Or not Mike Grell, sorry. I said Mike Grell. Dave Cockrum left okay. DC Comics because they wouldn't give him his interior splash art from the book. Uh, and then he went on to draw some characters X something. Oh, the, some X characters? Yeah. Like X-Force? Sure. No, I don't insult Dave Cockrum. Like, okay, (laughs) look, I actually like Rob Liefeld. I think he's a really nice dude. But let's not compare Rob Liefeld art to Dave Cockrum art. Okay, okay, ever. At least from costume design standpoint, because that was Dave Cockrum's thing was designing those wacky ass 70s costumes. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, though Liefeld, I, I, you know what I do, you know, I have, we've, did we not just discuss this? I feel like I was just discussing Rob Liefeld's feet with somebody. Was that last week on the podcast? No, no, right it was now? not last week on the podcast, okay. but we have discussed it before where, I mean, uh, there's definitely a, a time frame in which there was no feet and then there were, um, some form of foot and then they, there became feet. Uh, you know who I was just discussing it with? Fog. Huh? I was just discussing it with your co-author oh, with, and with co-podcaster Tanner? when or, Travis oh, Webb. Oh, Travis Webb. Travis. Yeah. I was like, Tanner? No, not Tanner. Travis uh, that's Webb. who we were. That's who I was okay. talking to about. Oh, yeah, that's we what both, our consensus him. was that every time we've interacted with the guy, he's really nice. Uh, that doesn't mean he can draw feet, but it, it does mean he's really nice. We do get a little bit of a bait and switch with the cover of this issue. Oh, yeah. Because we get a, well, it's a Kurt Swan cover. Like, who doesn't want one of those? Uh, yeah, you see it, this and you're like, wow, this is great. This is, I mean, it looks jolly and cool. And you got the great display of character and stuff like that. It's, it's like a Norman Rockwell background yeah. with Superman flying a sleigh with Sandman and Sandy the Golden Boy. Mm-hmm. I believe that's Abel because Abel is House of Mystery, right? And Kane is House yeah. of Secrets, right? Yeah. You're like, you're digging into your brain there. I, I'm digging into my brain. I, I, I read a lot of them, uh, I believe. Yes. Yes. And there's uh, Wonder Woman mm-hmm. and Batman. Batman. 
And no offense to Kurt Swan, but we're going to get a much better looking Batman inside. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And of course, uh, we get Santa Claus. And it's interesting because as we go through these uh, with Kurt Swan, you get a much better Superman on the cover than you do inside. But uh, there's reasons for that, which we'll discuss in a minute. Get a much better Batman inside. I actually think I like the old school Wonder Woman better than the cover Wonder Woman. Oh. But I'll, yeah, I don't know where you're at. Um, I mean, Sandy and Sandman are drawn by Jack Kirby inside. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and Abel, Abel looks good. Abel looks a little yeah. bit too friendly, I think. He does. He looks so happy. Well, I mean, he's with Santa Claus. Of course he's going to look friendly. I mean, he's he's happy. I mean, he's not he's not trying to, you know, give you a sad story or, you know, scare the crap out of you. <laughs> Well, yeah, except Abel usually was trying to scare the crap out of you because he's sort of like the crypt keeper for the House of Mystery, which yeah. they couldn't have a crypt keeper because of the comics code. So mm-hmm. after EC and they move some folks over to uh, to DC, you get that different, I don't know, different kind of storyteller. Yeah. Well, no art, I, I think. Yeah. Because didn't they bring in and I'm looking at the back. Yeah, it was so Joe, Joe Orlando came over, right, mm-hmm. to do that stuff for DC to edit the line. And he had less freedom than he did in the past. Yeah. Can't have that scary, scary detail face. Well, we've got a lot of issues, so we are not going to go line by line through every no. single story that we will have for a couple of them. Here's Probably the Sandy and Sand, uh- Sandman story question for you and just so yeah. listeners listening because uh and, and for my own knowledge as well like these collector's editions as we're discussing this uh mm-hmm. these are a much larger comic correct oh yeah and i think i yeah. said tabloid size so if you're not familiar yeah. tabloid size is yeah it's so it's like the literally think of uh life magazine size mm-hmm. so if you actually if you're looking for <laughs> if you're looking for boards sometimes you have to look for like the life 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 magazine size tabloid it's much bigger i could go get out the tape measure but yeah i think aren't they uh 11 by 14 i believe so they're they're large they're big when i was holding mine that i actually own which maybe maybe if uh i record greg opening christmas presents uh and throw it up on youtube for everyone uh, i'll bring this book so you can actually see how big it is but they're they're big Uh, They're big issues. Uh, I bought a few years ago. Um, I try to keep I have multiple copies of couples, so occasionally I'll try to sell them. But they are hard to ship because (laughs) you have to get them uh, wrapped up. And sometimes the post office is uh, argumentative about whether or not they're books or not, because (laughs) by definition, a comic book, you can't ship uh, book rate, but you should be able to ship them book rate if they're from 1976 because the advertisements inside of them are no longer valid Valid, yeah yeah because it's not classified as a book it's classified as a magazine if it has advertisements it's not Mm -hmm. but so there's some debate among whether or not you know older stuff should be so it makes it really interesting to try to figure out how to ship these i guess is is the what you know what of it but yeah i mean this is really cool this was put out in 1976 um with a February, March cover date, uh, which is really interesting because that means that with the February, March cover date, they almost have a disadvantage because this definitely would have come out in 1975 at Christmas time. Mm-hmm. So, you you know, you go back on the cover date. So that's when it, these are weird, too, to me, like where you uh, it would come out in November or December. Right. So this is it's really weird, you know, with that weird publishing thing where the cover dates always ahead of the book. But in this case, you'd think you'd want the the publishing date to actually be December. <laughs> you, yeah, you would think you but... wouldn't. Yeah. Well, the whole point of putting the future cover date on is so it could stay on the newsstand and people would think that they're buying something that's new. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and in this case, I don't think you'd usually buy a Christmas issue in February. No, I but, just. But, you know, I mean, it. I guess for for their the the newsstand whatever how however they do their their weird uh bookkeeping i guess <laughs> well and we're also uh we're also in 1976 so we're a couple years before the dc implosion so carmen infantino is still the publisher and of course the dc implosion leads to major shakeups in the business and we see a lot less of these tabloids after that shakeup 
So mm-hmm. it's they're kind of a unique thing of their time. Uh, DC's come back with some tabloids in recent years and also some oversized books that aren't quite tabloid size. So uh, have been kind of the thing for the last couple of years uh, in sort of because they don't have the vertigo line anymore. But yeah. they have I'm trying blanking on the line. But those those books were a bigger than a comic book size, but not tabloid size. Hmm. Uh, and you will see some tabloid size books from time to time. I have a couple of Justice League books that they did tabloid size that were really neat. I have an entire tabloid size history of DC Comics written by Paul Levitz that hmm. is amazing. It's like a coffee table book, except it's like four or five inches thick. Uh, and you cannot hold it. You have to put it on the ground. <laughs> they actually oh, wow. came out with some that were smaller, that covered each era that he covered in the book, right? But it's a little bit more manageable. So they've done some fun things with tabloids here and there. Do you have any big tabloid experiences? Mine were getting those two Legion books, right? And yeah. then kind of discovering other tabloid books after that. I I don't have, uh, I have a couple uh, but they weren't something I collected just because they were too big to fit in boxes of stuff. And the ones that, like, I had a couple GI Joe si- GI Joe ones that were tabloid size. That um, and maybe a Transformer one. But everything was it, they just got messed up over time. Dog, now, dog eared, and <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, that'd be interesting over. too. We could maybe go back and look because you know the. Marvel had the oversized books too, and they maybe were still doing some tabloids in the 80s. I don't remember a lot of DC tabloids in the 80s. Yeah. Well, this is cool. Uh, It's neat. Uh, We get a huge cross section of the stories here. Uh, We get a book uh, from 1940, another one from, we get two from 1940, right? Two Mm -hmm. stories from 1940. We get another one from like 1970. Another one from the late 60s and then a letter one back from like 42. So it's a this is an interesting cross section of of stuff they sort of throw together. And it's interesting to me. This is a unique way, I guess, to repackage. And this is one of the sort of controversies from the 70s, too. Right. As you were starting to get artist artists and creator rights advocated for. Mm -hmm. Here we are in 75. Right. Around the time Neil Adams is uh, getting that stuff together. Yeah, uh, and here we are repackaging old stories and probably not paying people for them and throwing them in a book. And Neil Adams is one of the artists in the book. And he's like, where's my paycheck for my story? And I doubt he got one. So uh, yeah. it's interesting, too, you know, if you go in your publishing back matter, too, for your catalog from the 1940s. So I, I think the first thing uh, that you get is a Superman on the cover. That is definitely not the Superman you see in the story. So Mm -hmm. there is massive progress with the Superman character from 1940 to 1975. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it's real interesting. We'll get to it when we go through what the editing team is working on in the back. Uh, But Superman is in a very different place (laughs) than he was here. But here are some similarities that stuck with the Superman mythos over time. And this is kind of a fun way to look back at some of it. Uh, though I'll say our first story, uh, which is, let me make a click here. Uh, it's Superman, super, it came from Superman Christmas Adventure Volume 1 in 1940. It was done by Jerry Siegel writing, so the original Superman writer, but not Joe Schuster. By this point already, Jack Burnley had replaced Joe Schuster on the book. And Jack Burnley was the first major artist to draw Superman after, uh, Joe Schuster. Mm. So we've fully we're fully into uh uh national comics at the time right uh eliminating joe schuster from the work and people don't realize it was that early on wow i'm like progress <laughs> yeah like so superman comes out in 38 right so we're already off to another artist wow so we've got superman flying on the first page and we've got santa claus yeah and We'll do a little synopsis of this one. Uh, There's some stuff I want to point out in the book, and I'm sure you saw, too. Mm -hmm. Uh, But basically, we get uh, the first few pages and we get Superman and Lois Lane are basically doing toys for tots. Yeah. Yeah. And we meet a little boy who's throwing toys on the ground and breaking them and telling people he wants a motorboat or a yacht. Because he's not happy with his toys. (laughs) 
Well, and it's good it's, here that we see little Jeff Bezos right here <laughs> wanting his yacht. You know, it, it's very important. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's not pleased with the things that he has. So he needs more. But needs- unlike Jeff Bezos, this person didn't create a multi-billion dollar company. He just wants his parents to buy him a yacht. So, yeah. I mean, a little bit different, a little bit different than a small loan to start the company. I I was going to say, didn't they, though? Didn't they? Well, uh, Uh, that's up for debate. Technicalities. Probably so. Couldn't you just want to rock it? That's fair. (laughs) Well, uh, the little boy gets kidnapped by Superman. Yeah. Superman just like busts in, steals a kid. I'll give you a yacht. I mean, (laughs) yeah. He and do no, he takes he takes little uh, so and so. I don't remember his name already. <laughs> little James. Yeah, yeah there little we go. James. He takes little James flying around the city and shows him uh, sad children that don't have the things he has. Yeah. And why are you taking it's 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 a very it's like a very like a, a child Ebenezer Scrooge story. You know, uh, it's like yeah. I'm going to show you all these. Uh, why are you taking me to this tenement apartment? Why is she playing with a broken doll? Because she, he's like, I really doll never realized. Yeah, he's he's become woke now. He's never yeah. realized how much other people had. It's 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 OK. It, it's sort of weird that his reward for being a brat was to get to fly around the city with Superman. Yeah, it's um, I and, and you know, that's Superman's like holding him all all gingerly and nice and stuff like that. You know, he should have just like held him by his foot. <laughs> Well, the good news is we move the story along and we meet some people that flew to the North Pole on a spaceship. Uh, Jeff Bezos? <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe. <laughs> so um, they're known as Dr. Grouch and his crony, Mr. Meanie. So obviously, oh my gosh, went into the names of these characters <laughs> and they come to Superman's secret North Pole hideout where he's making toys and they try to attack Superman and the elves kick Superman, their ass and Claus. they leave. Yeah. Santa Claus. <laughs> I would say, Superman. sorry, Santa Claus, not Superman. Yes, <laughs> I said Superman. He's there. I was thinking. I was just trying to to move through. This yeah, way. yeah. So, but the but the elves have like zapper guns and stuff like that. And blast yeah. on them. It's pretty good. Well, it's, they it's, made them, you know. Yeah. So it's good. And then we transition. Uh, Doctor Grouch and Mister Meanie get a lot of places conveniently in this book. I have no idea how they get there, well, but they just show up. They just they they fly around and they're. In their spaceship, getting places, and they got gas guns, and they, they, gas Clark. Yeah, I just don't know why they have a spaceship or anything. But yeah, I mean, they take out Clark and Lois and try to light the Toys for Tots area on fire. I, I guess would, maybe they have something in their spaceship that lets them know every place somebody's trying to make toys for kids, and they just go and take it out. But we do learn that they want to basically turn the North Pole into an industrial factory. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, because they they don't really want it to to be there. So uh, while Dr. Grouch and and Mr. Meany, they decide after capturing Lois Lane and tying her to a rocket Mm. that they're going to go after Santa Claus again. They're going to shoot her into space. (laughs) Yeah. And well, and as they go, yeah, as they they're going to shoot her into space as they go. The panels are sort of weird on page eight. Yeah. Well, anyway. Uh, they capture Lois Lane, who, oh, she tries to go after them, right? Because as Lois Lane does, mm-hmm. it gets captured because, you know, damsel in distress. Right. The early Superman was such a, a mind fuck because you have Lois Lane, who as a character, right, is odd for the times. I guess even though it's during World War II, uh, you do have more women working in factories in different places. But you have a, a female reporter for an, a major newspaper, which is kind of groundbreaking for a kid to read about in comics. Right. Mm-hmm. You've, you're you're role breaking. But obviously, if you know, obviously, Superman mythos, she's constantly the damsel in distress in the stories, too. So it's a it's always sort of a weird she's, dynamic. Well, she's 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 groundbreaking, but also getting herself into trouble because she's she's pushing the boundaries. Right. So because she's just a girl reporter. I, of course, it's how she is written. But yeah. No. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying I was. Yeah. But yeah. And again, we talk about to sort of evaluating these for when they were written in their time. Yeah. Right. So uh, it is sort of groundbreaking for their time. But they continuously do go back to the same trope over and over yeah. again. Uh, they do it like three times in this story. <laughs> they, yeah. they keep putting her in the same. It's like, seriously, 
she's like she gets gas she gets put on a rocket by these guys dr grouch and mr meanie and then they 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 just keep putting her into bad situations and she keeps either getting out of them or you know superman saves her over and over. usually superman saves her yeah and and we do have the classic s on superman too we don't have the modern stylized s yet so no, no. Yeah. run the run the classic uh, by the time it is no Kryptonian armor symbol or family symbol or something uh, that that's long before any of that's yes. created. So he rescues her and then somehow she gets in trouble again, like you said. Uh, but now and, and then we find out that that Dr. Grouch and Mr. Meany, uh, the elves have discovered that they've kidnapped all of the reindeer. Yeah, kidnapped the reindeer. Like, I don't and, know and where this truck came from. Weren't they in a spaceship? Like, it, how did they get a truck to the North Pole? What's crazy is that they can be in, like, in Metropolis and and keep going back and forth. They're, like, they're, they're super fast, right? So they're moving lightning speed. They're capturing Lois. Then they're they're stealing the reindeer from Santa, where, you know, like, they're, they're just moving at a lightning speed faster than Superman, apparently. Well, Superman and, rescues the reindeer, but doesn't disable Mr. Meany, and he, like, shoots the reindeer with knockout gas. Uh, so now there's no one to fly the sleigh. Like, that's how unfortunate. I, I couldn't have predicted this was going to happen in the story, but any guesses on who's going to fly the sleigh? Is it going to be... Uh, it's going to be... Mr. Meany? Yeah. No? So I don't honestly know. We're in 1940. I assume we're at the... Well, yeah, we're at the radio show point, so it's up, up and away, right? So it's not just jumping Superman now. It is full on up, up in the way with the flying noises in the background on the radio show. So yeah. he's flying the sleigh around. Uh, they and he doesn't. I uh, now soon we're going to learn why he doesn't take out Mr. Meany and Dr. Grouch, because Dr. Grouch and Mr. Meany are going to learn the true meaning of Christmas, because just nobody ever gave them a present as a little boy. Oh, my gosh. And, that's and when they Santa. got presents from Santa Claus, they their hearts turned and now they're happy and they, they love Christmas. They got grinched. Their hearts yeah. grew three sizes that day. <laughs> and we find out the little James and his servants, yes. <laughs> that's how they're referred to in the story, are yes. going to go deliver presents to other little needy kids. Mm hmm. And yes, Superman dude. says, I hope all you readers will remember to be generous to those less fortunate than yourselves. And now Merry Christmas to you and a happy new year. The end. All right. So Superman wasn't out there to start. <laughs> and, and you know what? I was going to start. on. I'm done with that story. You know what? Because I turned the page because this actually happened when I was reading and I see Neil Adams art and I'm like, okay. oh, yeah, I, I've forgotten the I've forgotten the first story already. It's It's gone. It's gone. Neil Adams art. Here we go. Let's do it. And yeah, Silent so, Night of Batman. We get uh, Frank Robbins is the writer, so it's not a Denny O'Neill no. book. It's a backup story. Uh, Frank Robbins, I didn't know much about, uh, but he did a lot of Superman, girl, Superman's girlfriend, Lois Lane. OK. And some Superboy and some detective comics. I don't think he did a lot of Superboy and the Legion because I don't know much about this guy at all. So those things didn't cross. And he, he did a he did a little Batman and detective as well. Uh, it says his contribution to Batman is notable for returning the character to his dark theme, a part of departure of the Silver Age camp style. Ah, that would explain how this story is so dark for a Christmas story. Yeah. And so they, they do put him together with uh, it's not even that dark, but yeah. What are you Working. talking about? It's the darkest silent night of Batman I've ever read. Right. Silent He's silent night OK. It does acknowledge he was working with uh, Denny O'Neill and Julie Schwartz, the editor at the time, to okay. to make that change. So, OK, that makes a little bit more sense. It also says he he did some work for Marvel in the 70s on Captain America and Ghost Rider. Ah, which sort of makes sense if he's yeah. helping with the switch. I love so. that show. Ghost Rider. So good. It's not. Wait, what? Do you, no. <laughs> Stop. <I read>. No. <laughs> uh, imagine, okay. imagine being a kid in the 90s and being like, I like, I like Ghost Rider, Mom. And then getting a Ghost Rider shirt because you keep like trying to come home and watch Ghost Rider. 
and then your mom gets you a flaming skull shirt and you, yeah. you have to wear it for you know because you got it for christmas and this happened to you um no not to me but i read about it <laughs> okay well uh we are off to the batman story the silent night yeah. and of, batman. of the batman commissioner gordon calls batman <laughs> oh Wait, you know what? First off, we have Batman looking down at this amazing city scene and cityscape that Neil Adams drew. Yeah. All these people out shopping. And we have all these like really cool faces and realistic faces because like mm-hmm. Neil Adams drew them all the way through. Yeah. I mean, it's a really good it's a good panel. <laughs> it's I mean, really- the art. Yeah. Before we get into the story, the art really it's a podcast. So you can't see the art. Right. But, you know, you go should. pull this up on the DC app or. Did I say what issue? What was it's Batman that this is in this, but it was originally in Batman 219. Go if you it. want to go look it up. And yeah, the art is just amazing. OK, so in the story, commission, simple story. It's just an eight pager. Commissioner Gordon calls Batman with the bat signal and Batman's like, why? It's like Christmas Eve. And they're like, no, you're going to sing Christmas carols with us. So all of Gotham's finest and Batman sing Christmas carols and. We see what happens in the city. One little boy steals a package from a lady, opens it up, and there's a Batman toy in there, and he wraps it back up because it's Batman because he's sad, and he gives it back to the to the woman. And I learned something, by the way. And so yeah. they were singing Jingle Bells for that, and then they start singing We Three Kings of Orient, and either they're wrong or I are. I are. I are. I are. I are. Mm-hmm. You are. I are what I are, and I am what I am. The... Uh, I've always thought it was bearing gifts. We travel afar and it says bearing and gifts. We traverse afar. And in the back, when they give me the lyrics, it says traverse afar. So I learned something today about we three Kings. Maybe they had to change the lyrics for copyright infringement. I don't know. Maybe so, but they listened I mean, they, to they, the authors well, in the back. They, they said this was the DC lyrics for, Oh, did they? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I, well, you know, anyway, I, we get a man with a gun and he's about to do something bad. We're not really exactly sure what, what, because he stumbles into a, a guy that looks like Batman. He gets scared for a minute then he finds out it's the support Wayne Foundation Christmas drive for the blind. And he looks at his gun and he feels sad and he throws it away. Yeah. And then this was uh, this book is in 1970. So you'll know the time frame is the Vietnam War. And we get a woman and she's sad because she doesn't think her soldier boyfriend slash husband we don't know is coming home she goes to a bridge and it looks like she's going to jump off but right before she's going to jump off the bridge the soldier jumps out of a truck sees her there and hugs her and he's back and so she's okay i'm not sure what that one had to do with batman making the city better but i mean if batman was there he might have stopped her yeah well, and then we get to Silent Night, Holy Night, all is bright. And then Batman realizes it's six o'clock in the morning and he's actually falling asleep because he sees like a shadow Commissioner Gordon. He punches up in the air as he wakes up. So now now we know what Batman does when he wakes up in the morning. He punches into the sky. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> My eyes are trying playing tricks on me. Ah! Yeah. And then Commissioner Gordon says, we've been waiting here all night and not a single call has come in for you. It appears the investment you've put into the city has paid off tonight, giving you a night off. And Batman's oh. like, investment, spirit, Batman, spirit of Batman, Christmas spirit. Hmm. And he says the end. Um, though I will say, like, imagine if it was like a Nolan verse Batman singing Christmas carols. Yeah. Now, how would that go? I'm Batman. Silent night. Holy night, all is calm, all is bright. I'm Batman. <laughs> and and then, you know, he he would like, he'd probably like punch a bunch of people instead of punching into the air. And then he's like, have a silent night on Batman. You know, the interesting part is it yeah. says Frank Robbins was the writer here. Mm. And I was wrong because I was looking at the wrong thing on the page. It wasn't Frank oh. Robbins. I look up all that stuff on Frank Robbins mm-hmm. <laughs> and it was Mike Friedrich who wrote it. Oh, OK. <laughs> Ah. Well, <sighs> so it well, is. there we go. So I'm, I gave you all that start off <laughs> stuff on Robbins over the long author as Friedrich wrote it here on Funny Book Forensics. We give you the details that you deserve, the wrong details that you didn't deserve. <laughs> uh, but Friedrich's done all sorts of things. So there we go. 
There you go. Uh, well, and you got a little bit of history of Frank Robbins. So, OK, way to go, Dan. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. My, Mike Friedrich's like 30 years younger than Frank Robbins. It's true. <laughs> and is still writing stuff now. But hey, that's good. <laughs> I just feel obligated to share that Friedrich did some Justice League and some Flash and a bunch of shit at Marvel. So a bunch. A bunch. Okay. <laughs> well, there we go. Dan messing up the podcast already. It's you right. know what? That that seems like a perfect time to move to our House of Mystery story. Yeah. When I flipped the page and I saw House of Mystery, I was because I didn't even read what was in the book. I just like flipped the page and I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> this is great. Well, what does this book have in common with the last book? nothing at all story. Well, i mean it, it, it's christmas themed well you wouldn't know it neil adams drew the cover for this oh. book in 1971 oh, okay. but we don't have the cover we just have the story on okay. the interior well that's it's cool. another backup story uh len ween wrote it you've probably oh. heard of that guy did heard of that guy he did he maybe remember we did he work with dave cockram on something important uh, for the x-men i i believe so yeah um or some character that starts with a wolf uh uh, oh, the 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 wolf, uh, the wolf, uh, the 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 wolf of uh, ha- of Havel of. Um, sure. Of, so this comes from House of Mystery, <laughs> Volume One, Number One Ninety One. Yeah. And, and Kane kind of looks like a Wolverine. He does actually. Yeah. <laughs> and we get um, Kane and Mrs. Claus. Yeah, of course. And this one's da- drawn by Bill Drott, who, again, this is where I need experts next to me to tell me what's happening. Uh, but I don't know anything about this guy at all. I thought the art was pretty cool. Oh, yeah, definitely. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty neat. Uh, apparently he retired in the early 80s from comics, so he wasn't around too long in comics. But, yeah. Probably been doing comics for a long time before that or telling stories a long time before that. <laughs> Well, Kane has a story, or not Kane, sorry, Abel. How we just talked about this, Dan. No, this I, is Kane. This is Kane. Oh, this is Kane. So Kane this is House Kane. of Mystery, and Abel is House of Secrets, right? Secrets, yeah. Yeah. So the, they had the two houses. Okay. So I was, yeah, I, I, I had it backwards before. Well, right? you know, it doesn't matter. I, I can't figure out who Kane and Abel are. I know who they are in the Bible, I guess, but not here. But House of Mystery. House of Mystery. We get a story. And basically, we get a story of the Night Prowler and we have uh, two parents watching television together and we get this line, which this is the line of the book, of course, that, you know, brings it back to reality. And they're watching the news and the husband says wars in the Middle East, racial strife at home and murders, mugging and strikes. Mm -hmm. I was like, ah, this this book was written in 2023. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just watched the news with my grandma and it feels like that's um pretty much on par <laughs> and the guy says something you could never say in a comic book now there are times i and i'd wish they just dropped the bomb and end it all yeah Jeez. no yeah that's uh <laughs> okay friend a little little rough for is this archie bunker you want me to see if uh you want to see if it had a, a stamp on the book <laughs> no <laughs> probably it, i don't know if it did or not but well anyway uh oh man Brendan Wrightson did the art on this yeah, wow. that's that's great. No. Yes. Yes. No. Yes. Bernie yes, Wrightson. he did. Sorry. Yeah, yeah you're right. Mm hmm. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Want to tell us about Bernie Wrightson? Uh, amazing artist. Just like if you look at anything horror related is I mean, like he is like uh, I have a bunch of Bernie Wrightson trading cards because they're just great to look at. <laughs> like uh, they're fantastic he he drew a lot of um a lot of these house of mystery books uh and uh how's it um like house of secrets and stuff like that but just a lot of horror he drew specter and showcase for dc yeah Yeah. but what is he probably most known for Uh, to a common comic books fan not a not a horror fan Oh, that's that swamp uh, thing book. The swamp thing, yeah. <laughs> that created, swamp thing. Swamp book. thing with Len Wein. Yeah, yeah. That swamp so. thing book. Uh, that, that, yeah, that 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 little book. Um, yeah. So if you're if you're familiar with that, then you're you're familiar with Bernie Wrightson. Um, but yeah, his his horse stuff is freaking mind melting. 
And this was just a couple page backup story in House of Mystery. We've got the the couple goes upstairs. By the way, the shadowing in this uh, art is really cool. You never yeah. really see the guy's eyes until the end mm-hmm. of the story. Uh, you see them. You see them at the beginning of the story. And then it's at night when the the supposed horror piece is happening. Right. You don't see his <laughs> eyes. But uh, he, they the couple hear something downstairs. He's like, I'm going to grab my shotgun and blow their head off. Um yeah. And he goes downstairs and he looks at his eyes are open, reopened. His eyes are closed and then they're reopened when he's like, I'll be a son of a gun. And he comes back upstairs and there and his wife is like, Fred, have you gone crazy? And he's like, no, at least I don't think so. I just have the feeling that there may be hope for us yet. So it's pretty obviously he's seen Santa Claus downstairs delivering presents and he doesn't shoot him and he goes to sleep. Yeah. It says Merry Christmas. So now all is right in the world because sure. And it says at the end, quiet hoofbeats rose from the roof, carrying the sound of jingle bells out over the city towards the coming dawn. And it does say towards, not toward. So I, it's not me saying the word wrong. Towards. It should be toward, right? That's bad editing, right? Towards. Not towards. Sure. Towards. <laughs> well, we get a splash anyway. page with no legion of superheroes in it. Greetings from the superheroes. <laughs> Christmas yeah. greetings. And then, I always love these, so this should give you, so 1975, this is what they're advertising at the time. I really thought it was, I thought it was actually interesting The Legion is not here at all, uh, and either is the Justice League. Here's what they're promoing right now. Batman and Robin, Superman, Wonder Woman, and the Golden Age Green Lantern and Flash, so we're getting that rebirth of the Golden Age there. We get their... Fawcett Comics, folks. So we get Captain Marvel Jr. and Captain Marvel and Mary Marvel all in this. So they had gone hard in uh, yeah. trying to use the property they they won in a lawsuit in. <laughs> uh, it was like late 1940s. Or was it early? 50s? Well, anyway, I forget when the Fawcett Comics lawsuit ended. And this is an early 50, right? It wasn't like 1951. But anyway, somebody else can look it up and tell me I'm wrong. But they're trying to get those properties. Of course, you had the 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 Shazam ISIS power hour on TV and Shazam cartoons, believe it or not, would last at least up to 81. Cause I just looked up for a book I'm writing the cartoon lineup in 1981. And there was still a Shazam cartoon on in 81, yeah. which yeah. I didn't know yeah. uh, what I learned, by the way, and look, uh, let me finish the page. I'll tell you what I learned by looking stuff up. Uh, Wonder woman is on here and Superboy, So they're really promoting the heck out of Batman, Superman, uh, the Marvel family and the Golden Age heroes with okay. I, that was interesting. Just what they're choosing. By yeah. the way, I discovered why. Just side note, we mentioned Sundar the Barbarian when we were doing the Jack Kirby stuff. Yeah. Do you know why I didn't watch Sundar? Why? Because it was on at the same time as Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Oh, that makes sense. You yes. So what you yeah, you're like, OK, I can only watch one of these things. And I'm going to choose this. Yeah. So as a six-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old, I was watching Spider-Man and his amazing friends instead of Thundar. And yeah, it's so that explains if you were listening to our last podcast, not the last one, but the one before you'll now, you know why Danny, little Danny Shabbat wasn't watching Thundar, even though it looked cool because I was watching Spider-Man and his amazing friends. So there we go. Uh, now we get a Wonder Woman issue by Charles Moulton. Of course, we know that is now Charles Moulton Marston. And if you want a crazy history of the beginning of Wonder Woman, uh, the crazy history, you can watch uh, Moulston and his Wonder Women uh, yeah. semi uh, kind of biographical pick about their family. And it's fascinating. I won't get too far into that right now. And we also get uh, art by... Uh, Harry G. Peter, and this comes from Sensation Comics, Volume 1, at ni- at number 14 in 1943. So we are uh, well in the middle of World War One. Mm-hmm. Two. Two. Or two? Yeah. Jeez, Dan. <laughs> it's cool. I just, you know what? I just became a DC movie editorial where we're just going to move Wonder Woman into World War One for her movie instead of talking about World War Two. Because, I mean, why would we do that? Like, why would we? Well, anyway, so... <laughs> Uh, we get, uh, this is probably uh, the writing in this is so much more advanced than the Superman story. Yeah. It is. And if you know a little bit about, uh, Moulton Marston, uh, he was trying to use the books to teach kids. Mm-hmm. 
and tell a story at the same time is psychologist, right? Right. So you're going to find a whole it's it's almost like when you read this, it's almost like uh, you're on a spy hunt for the tidbits he's trying to teach kids. Mm hmm. So, number one, he starts out by naming something a or he names the it's like the phylum. I don't know. It's, I'm getting, uh, what are all the names of plants? Like it's, oh, yeah. No, he names the tree. He, he tells you the names like of animals. the trees and stuff like that. He gives you the, <laughs> the animals and stuff. He's... But he gives you the Albies balsamia to so you know it's a fur balsam right so you know mm -hmm. what those are called scientifically yeah. slides that in there maybe I, I definitely needed these as a kid clearly because i don't even know what i'm talking about when it comes to biology <laughs> right so i clearly needed these things dropped for me as a kid uh and we get the story of how this fur uh this fur tree meets wonder woman mm -hmm. at christmas time and yeah. so uh steve is that steve trevor i assume and Diana are scouting out and she's in her Diana Prince costume and she's going to go scout one area and he's going to go scout another area for Nazis because we got to get those Nazis out of America because they're everywhere. I don't think they're in America, though. Oh, they are in America. Are they in America? Yep. OK. He said that's village. That village is Greenville. Hmm. Right next to the Canadian border. Oh, okay. Yes. On the other side of the mountain oh. is Mill Junction. Escaped German prisoners from Canada are being smuggled oh, okay. from Greenville across the mountain to the junction. See, I read this thing. Oh, see, I, I, I skipped over. Like, I must have skipped that over. And I hear I'm thinking they're in Germany the whole time. No, they are. <laughs> they are dead. They're in the United States because that's where all the Nazis are hanging out. OK. And I have a I mean, I think it's interesting because if you know, I have a little take a little bit of an issue with this, even though historically I understand why it's here. But William Moulton Marston was always standing on the fact that he was trying to to write these books to help educate kids. But that seemed like a, a thing that could go really wrong, educating people, like making mm. them really uber paranoid for things that don't exist. Right. But they also, <laughs> for whatever reason, couldn't always have Wonder Woman in Germany fighting Nazis. So, right. I don't know. It's it's just a <laughs> weird it, it's weird. Uh, then he teaches you how to do decoding. Yeah. Which is kind of cool. And we find out that. Wonder Woman has to go to some cave named K3. And oh, and she's being flirted with by the tree, by the way. Oh, yeah. The tree finds her quite att attractive. In fact, the line is, I thought Diana was a dull looking girl, but she changed her clothes. And suddenly I realized she was beautiful. <laughs> so when women are oppressed by the clothing that makes them cover themselves up, they are ugly and dull. But when they get down to a bathing suit and a, uh, unbreakable rope, they're beautiful. Uh, I guess. I mean, this is right in line with his philosophy of the world. So yeah. Interesting character. He is. <laughs> he <laughs> yeah, was. Well, <laughs> the next little <laughs> bits of the story are, are more interesting. Cause we get like, uh, spousal abuse um it's it, the whole like it 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 whirlwinds it's like it happened like all that happens so fast it's like what is going on like it's not it's not necessarily spousal abuse but it's like uh like it's like this dude like doesn't he's like he walks in on his wife being like manhandled by some dude and instead of actually like, finding out what's going on he's like no, I'm done with you. I'm packing up the kids and we're leaving. And it's like, uh, after you beat up the dude and then you're just like, I'm not going to even talk to you and find out your side of what's going on. Like, yeah, I'm, this dude, it's like, it, it's, I, it, it's just well, like, and, and kids lost in the woods because they ran away from their dad who did. All da this yeah. Stuff. Yeah. It's, it's a domestic situation. It's it, it definitely a domestic situation. Of some sort, but it's like it's it's a dude that just doesn't like he's he's like obviously like uh, doesn't want to he's not dealing with any of the situation any any of what's going on in his house very well. I also find it to be a really uncomfortable trope. Right? I mean, you go from the 19 teens where we have movies where black men are trying to rape white women and mobs go after them. And now we have a German man speaking German trying to rape a white woman. And the husband walks in and thinks they're together instead of her being in distress. Mm -hmm. It's just really, it's not good in any time period. Yeah. 
it's just like, okay. Birth of a Nation, by the way, is the movie I'm referring to. If folks yeah. don't know what I'm talking about, uh, but the Ku Klux Klan was always trying to paint black men as going after and trying to rape white women. And it's like we've just lifted and shifted, right? We've just literally lifted and shifted that to these Germans because now they're the villain, right? The, yeah. And yeah, it's it's awkward and uncomfortable in any time. I don't like this at all. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then you got the kids that run away from their dad and then they're like lost in the woods. Then they meet these um, people that are like, oh, hey, well, we'll help you. Yeah. <laughs> And then they the yeah, and they're Germans, too, of course. So they demand the they capture they kidnap the little boy and take the little girl and they go to the house to get steal food. And then they capture the dad. And then Wonder Woman comes back on skis Mm -hmm. because it's snowing outside. Yeah, there's snow on the ground. I mean, it makes sense. Wonder Woman's a fantastic skier, too. And she doesn't even need poles. Yeah. That's what I haven't quite figured out, like how she does her cross country skiing. Oh, I mean, she's agile, quick. <laughs> but you, you usually have to like propel Use yourself with something, right? Like she, she, she's good at not using poles. Well, we then get another one where it's the same German guy has recaptured mom and is binding her. And if you want to get more into this binding stuff. Uh, I'm not going to get into it here. Just watch, watch that the movie. movie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot of binding. Lot and of binding. then and then we get into this again, super awkward part. I think I know people, you know, I, it's interesting because you watch the movie and then I go back and read one of these issues and I'm like, I don't see this as a feminist thing, like a feminist triumph. I see it as just a guy trying to, like, get off on something. Uh, but Wonder Woman propels everybody over to go after the bad guys. And then she has Jeb, who is the father, tie her to a tree with her lasso. She she ties up Jeb and then Jeb ties her up. (laughs) Yes, she ties up Jeb and flings him across. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of binding. There's a lot of tying up in this book. I mean, right now I've seen three people get tied up at one point now. And then then they say, I know Wonder Woman's bonds were tight for I, too, could feel them. At last, her endurance was rewarded. So that's the tree talking tied to her friend, friend, the tree who was stretching out his branch. It's there. I don't know. Their branches. Yeah, their branches to embrace her earlier. And then she tells the Nazi that comes to get her. I was bound by a man I trusted. Like she's indicating she's helpless because she was bound by a man she trusted. Yeah. And then. Uh, OK. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what's happening. It's part of it's part of it's part of her ploy to get him to take her back to wherever they're hiding out. Right. So he's like, oh, I'll take you back. And then he, instead of like freeing her, just keeps her tied up and duck walks her back to the cave. Yeah. In a very awkward, like with a rope around her neck and she's still tied up and it's, you know, they, they end up back in the cave and she's paraded around a bunch of Nazis saluting and stuff like that, which is, I mean, awkward again. <laughs> and then, and then for some reason they untie her off panel yeah, and bind her to a door, I guess. I yeah. mean, um, she just breaks it and rescues the little boy and breaks everybody out of the cave. And I don't know what happened to the Nazis. Uh, they just left, right? I guess they say the cave is a trap because they abandon it. It explodes. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. And then she busts everybody out, causes an av- avalanche by rolling a giant rock that was covering the cave. Uh, yeah. Now, um, you could say the stone was rolled away. Yeah. From the cave. The cave, yeah. Even though this is a Christmas issue, but yeah. Yeah, a I mean, little more iconography going yeah, yeah. on. And then I can't imagine this is fun for our listeners. Hopefully it is. <laughs> I, 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 you know, usually like I'm either outraged or happy. I am just kind of baffled by this. Like, I don't it's know a, what's going on. It's it's a weird it's a weird story. Well, and then she, she fights a tree 
Well, she didn't fight the tree. No, that's her friend. She's rescuing the tree. The rescues the tree. Oh, yeah. But she all of a sudden. She's from the avalanche. Yeah, and we get a glimpse. They'd sent for Steve, Trevor, and Etta Candy and her girls, and they're just all running away from the avalanche. That's the whole. We see them in one panel. Yeah. And then uh, she grabs the tree, and apparently the tree tells a nice story about how it was put in the yard of the family that all gets back together because she forgives her husband after being captured by Nazis for a year and just goes back. (laughs) And then they're all friends. And Wonder Woman says, I hope I remembered everything the children want. Playing Miss Santa Claus is the most fun of all. She brings everybody presents. Uh, uh. It's a story. <laughs> yeah. It's a story. I was a little. Um, hey, a Merry Christmas was had by all. The end. Sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> OK. Yeah. Well, um, well, we get a, we get a Santa scrambled super list. And again, by Bob Rosakis, who's an editor at D.C. Right. And uh, we get a little bit of of who they're promoting, too, because in the so. Abel, oh. Adam Strange, Aqualad, Aquaman. So Teen Titans show up. Adam, Batman, Black Canary, Brainiac, Kane, Captain Marvel, Captain Marvel, June, Clark Kent, Claw, Claw the Uncon, is it Claw the Unconquered? Claw the Unconquered. I got a Poo Rock. Commissioner Gordon. Uh, you you got a what? Poo Rock. Poo Rock. Yeah. If you read across the bottom, you got a uh, second second roof from the bottom. You got Black Canary and a Poo Rock. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're supposed to look for. I think that's for Sergeant Rock. No, but you got a Poo Rock. Do you see Poo well, Rock? Well, yeah. You know, the interesting thing, too, is they say it's Sergeant SGT period Rock. Right. But they put Sergeant. You don't have to look for the Sergeant part. But why didn't they just put SGT? That way it wouldn't be Black Canary Poo Rock. It would just be Black Canary <laughs> Sergeant Rock. Yeah, but you don't get Sergeant Rock there. You just got Poo Rock. <laughs> I just find it funny. <laughs> it's a Poo Well, anyway, rock. I'm I got scramble. a Poo Rock. Uh, we get some interesting, uh, again, no Legion references, which makes me sad. We do get a Morgan Edge reference, which is funny because the bat, the Superman stories are so different than the 1970s. They go to work for Morgan Edge and are on TV instead of working for Perry White. Like, mm. that's a little weird. OK. Uh, and uh, we get some D.C. staff members even get their names in here. So Denny O'Neill is in the crossword puzzle. Yeah. But, you know, who's not? Paul Evans is in the crossword puzzle. But you know who's not in the crossword puzzle for sure? Who? Neil Adams is definitely not in the crossword puzzle. Joe Cooper is. Joe Orlando is. Uh-huh. There's two, but it's one is Orlando and one is Joe. Uh-huh. Well. Yes. Should we get, get away from that Wonder Woman story? <laughs> yeah, let's go do that. Let's see what the Sandman has for us. Well, the Sandman has a lot for us. If you are a, if you go back to the day we recorded this, which I won't tell you, you can see I posted something on the Funny Book Forensics Facebook page about what I make Greg read. Oh, yeah. And it was this. Yeah. And it was this. Who would ever suspect Santa Claus of being a tool of the ruthless underworld? Who would ever dream that the merry, kindly old bewhiskered gent would be connected with cunning, conniving crooks? Apparently nobody. That is nobody except the nocturnal nocturnal nemesis of crime, Sandman who rides the dark night along with his gallant companion, Sandy, the golden boy <laughs> to rot out. <laughs> 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 to rout out evil and injustice but it takes some fast thinking and faster action before the phantom pair can set things right for a merry yuletide <laughs> By Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. (laughs) I don't know. Yeah. Uh huh. That's the entry page for this. Um, And by the way, this is Sandman in Santa Fronts for the Mob, uh, which originally appeared in Adventure Comics Volume 1, number 82, January of 1943. Uh, and this was written by Jack Kirby, penciled by Jack Kirby and inked by Joe Simon, even though it's credited as Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, interestingly enough. And uh, got it lettered by Howard Ferguson and editor Jack Schiff. So 
Uh, this is uh, from the the infamous uh, early run, uh, well, second run of Sandman. So you had the first run of Sandman in the Golden Age, where he has the big filter mask on. Uh, Jack Kirby and Joe Simon are asked by DC to reinvent them, and they basically make Batman, make him into Batman with a sidekick. Wait a minute. Batman already has a sidekick. <laughs> yeah, well, now Sandman has a sidekick, too. Sandy the Golden Boy. <laughs> and... <laughs> They do a lot with uh, Sandman Rides the Dark Knight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they do a lot with these characters later. Uh, Wesley Dodds, obviously the Sandman, uh, uh, was brought back into DC proper uh, by Neil Gaiman. Right. And in, in mm-hmm. that but not brought back. I mean, they brought West Dodds back several yeah. times. Also super famous for his uh, role in Kingdom Come as the <laughs> storyteller right in the yeah. hospital bed. Um that's interacting with the narrator. So mm-hmm. uh, really cool stuff. Sandy, the golden boy later becomes sand and eventually Sandman as well. Uh, he becomes part of the Jeff Johns justice society uh, yeah. in the two thousands. So they, they do use the characters again. Uh, one theme that these characters have when they're not in the Joe Simon and Jack Kirby piece is they see like they can see uh, things in their dreams. And so kind of that dreaming power piece. Yeah. And sometimes it can manifest itself in different ways, depending on who the writer is. And so some these characters have been used pretty well. Uh, this one was great for me. I had never gone back and read one of these Sandman uh, books, uh, but this was always very controversial. Uh, Jack Kirby or just I mean, Jack Kirby came over to D.C. and they were on this book for a while. And then they got in a fight with D.C. editorial and they left. And sure. Jack Kirby was basically banned from D.C. for this until they rehired him in the 70s after his run with Marvel. So, yeah, it's just it's kind of a fascinating. Uh, I, I, these are fascinating pieces. Uh, I, I, I think this and then it's interesting because the first thing we get is a guy dreaming, uh, mm-hmm. which is kind of like what the Sandman would do. So, yeah. Uh, anyway, we find out that this tycoon, his name is F.P. Miller. He's a department store tycoon. And he ate lobster, and apparently that doesn't do good for him because he has these bad dreams. And uh, these bad dreams manifest as uh, somebody exposing that his Santa Claus is is phony. And then everybody thinks all the things at his store are phony. And then he wakes up, and he's like, I got to find a perfect Santa Claus. Yeah. So, all right. But now we start to get to the cool stuff. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. The mob. What? (laughs) Yeah. So, uh... (laughs) <laughs> hey there i got i can't do mob voice <laughs> hey so you want a mob voice either <laughs> hey oh so we're looking for the best santa you're doing my i know i'm just doing my job. I'm just a monster i don't know what's happening right now macho is a mobster <laughs> i guess Macho, macho, I'm going for like he's used wise guys and you're doing hey, much use wise guys. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> I, boss, I got a terrific idea. We're going to get we go. boss into the business. Huh? Santa Claus, you're crazy. Well, and basically the idea is them to go find some rube to, to be Santa Claus and then yeah. uh, and have him be Santa Claus and they'll steal from the department store. So or the people that buy from there. So uh, the mobsters go out and they meet Mountain Man Beard, who is a wrestler. And we found out this is an analog for a wrestler named Man Mountain Dean, who actually was from New York originally. Mm -hmm. And apparently he went on to do some crazy stuff like he was a stuntman and all sorts of things. But he apparently went on to do a bunch of stuff for the army that was just declassified in like 2021. Yeah. Uh, And all there's a great article by one of the senior editors at Sports Illustrated, uh, John Wertheim. And you, Greg and I both read this this afternoon. I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but it's fascinating. It is wild. And uh, but that this was not known. So he had apparently done an amazing job because Joe Simon and Jack Kirby write this guy as just a complete buffoon pro wrestler who doesn't know anything and is dumb. And one of his original gimmicks was something like wasn't it like the Hell's Kitchen Hillbilly? 
yeah, yeah, the Hell's Kitchen hillbilly, where he's just like this, this you know, hillbilly from Hell's Kitchen. And when you link it back, Suicide Slum in the Kirby Simon world is Hell's Kitchen in New York. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I thought this was <laughs> maybe the side story might have been cooler than the main story. But it's, we, yeah. It's so crazy. I mean, well, I mean, some of the stuff we read about and like, again, not get into it, but I mean, he was Hulk Hogan before Hulk Hogan. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, I, I want a movie about this guy. Well, and, you know, yeah. I all I didn't know watching wrestling, I guess I just I just got on. I was like, this guy has to be real. So I did some quick research. You know, they had other man mountains when we were kids watching wrestling, like man mountain rock, the guy with the mm -hmm. guitar. Right. Yeah. And, so they were always trying to reuse this man mountain gimmick, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The big, by Jack Kirby and I, they just take man mountain Dean, they turn it into mountain man beard. And let me tell you, this guy looks just like in the comic, looks just like the guy in real life did. You, yeah, you do a side by side, and in the picture, when I'm looking at the article and the picture that pops up is like, what the heck? This is the guy. This is Santa. I mean, this is this is the the guy the the jobber that they bring in. <laughs> and uh, and then they take some stabs at pro wrestling because uh, first off, the link to pro wrestling in the mob in New York not a surprising link to bring up in a comic book as a side thing. Mm -hmm. uh, New York was well known for wrestlers sort of taking the fall, so to speak, uh, mm -hmm. as and you know at the time. They would still bet on wrestling and things like that. Uh, by 1943, it had pretty much been exposed, but as fraudulent and wouldn't take off again really until you had the Dumont network um, in the 50s, right? Doing Gorgeous George and, and showing wrestling again. So yeah. uh, you, you have this kind of lull period. Also, in the Great Depression, people didn't have as much money to go in the 30s to like go to wrestling matches, right? So you weren't necessarily... Uh, getting as big a crowd but by the 40s we're in the war boom and uh you need entertainment but anyway we've got the man mountain and our got mountain man beard and he uh does some wrestling holds to himself in the ring is like isn't isn't this artistical <laughs> like, and, uh, <laughs> but they they want him to play santa so santa claus we, yeah we move on and uh we get uh in there we get two familiar figures in a front of miller store and we get Sandman and Sandy out of costume and the Sandman West Dodds recognizes something that is, is amiss. And so they leave and they follow Santa around and they find out that it is indeed Mountain Man Beard. Yeah. And there they go. And uh, we find out that the mob is publishing all sorts of nice things about Miller's department store. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know how... I just want to point out on page six how terrible it is that they're using Xmas instead of Christmas. They're destroying <laughs> Christmas. They're destroying Christmas. It, their paper wasn't very it, it wasn't large enough to put Christmas on there. It, well, that destroys Christmas. I don't understand. You we as children know that the 1980s were the first time that people started putting Xmas on things. And that's where our churches in the 1980s were all telling us that Xmas was destroying. We got to get the X out of Christmas. Remember, that was a big campaign. Oh, my gosh. It's true. It's true. Yeah. It just shows how ignorant we were then. OK, so uh, I thought it was just because we were Generation X and they didn't want us to celebrate it. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, our holiday. We find out that uh, the mob is using this as a we knew this already, but they they go to rob the little boy who uh, Pete, who was promised some presents. And, you know, what? I think I was wrong. I don't think the other other story did call them servants, by the way. I think it's this story. OK, so I just got the stories mixed up. It's my bad. But he says he sent the servants upstairs because Santa Claus is here and. So we James didn't call him servants. Pete did. My bad. Pete did. Pete did. Yeah, yeah. It was, it's Pete's fault. Pete. And Sandy and Sandman come in. Sandy, the golden boy and Sandman come in and temporarily take out the bad guys. But they recover and one hits a Sandman with a baseball bat and the other one hits Sandy with a baseball. And Sandman's down and yeah. Sandy's like, ow, because he got hit with a baseball, which doesn't really take you down most of the time so it hurts uh the mobster's like now nah, i'll take poison i'll charge at you sandman i can't are, are we close 
It was poisonal. Poisonal. I don't know. But uh, anyway, now a man, Mountain Man Beard is full. He was never with the gangsters to begin with, so he attacks them, takes them out. And Sandy the Golden Boy and Mountain Man Beard rescue Sandman, who seems fairly incompetent in the story. <laughs> And that brings us to our end, our ending. We arrest all the bad guys and uh, Mountain Man, Man Mountain, Mountain Man gets to work off his problems with the police by playing Santa Claus for the rest of Christmas. And everybody's happy at the end. Yeah. Yay. Yay. See, the Kings of Orient. Now, <laughs> I thought it was called We Three Kings. So maybe that's the difference. Maybe, yeah. So maybe this John H. Hopkins Jr., like licensed Kings of Orient and it was Could We be. Three Kings and he changed it from travel to traverse. Yeah. Maybe he changed Bearing it. gifts we traverse afar. Bearing gifts we travel afar. Bearing gifts we traverse afar. I I mean I guess it I think travel works better there. I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, maybe he just changed the later he wrote a different song slightly. Well the comic gives us Superman, the Justice League, uh huh, Batman and the Marvel family singing different Christmas carols with the words. We get a maze. And then we get season's greetings from DC editors. Oh, yes. Julie Schwartz, the big boss of Superman. He is also the Justice League grouper man from these Flash and Batman come uh, the best wishes. Murray Boltonoff edits Legion, Brave and the Bold, and falls in his region from World's Finest and Ghosts. Okay, so he does those. Joe Orlando does Eve, Cain, and Abel in House of Mystery and all that stuff. We got Joe Kubert is owning Sergeant Rock. No shock there. And mm -hmm. Tarzan. Tarzan. Uh, Jerry Conway is in charge of Plastic Man, Black Hawk, and Black Condor and the All-Stars. Oof. Oof. Well, <laughs> The implosion is going to hurt Jerry Conway. He's going to be back to writing. I'm just letting you know. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, back to writing the Legion. Uh, Denny O'Neill <laughs> oh, well, uh, uh, is editing Kung Fu Fighter, but also doing a bunch of writing. And yeah. E. Nelson Birdwell, well, he's E. Nelson Birdwell. Let's just, you know, I already almost said Julie Schwartz nicely, so we'll just leave E. Nelson Birdwell out of it. Uh, but yeah, uh, we're a couple years from the implosion, so... Uh, there'll be obviously a big shakeup when that happens yeah. at in DC leadership. But yeah, I don't know. It was a it was a collection. Yeah, it was a, it was a lot of stories. <laughs> it was a there was there was some really really fun reads. It was uh, the difficult one. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, I would recommend. I mean, after reading this, I think going back and digging into the uh, the the Jack Kirby and Joe Simon Sandman stuff could be fun. I'd, I'd want to yeah. see what else they're referencing in pop culture and what they're doing with their book. Yeah, it seemed it seemed to be a little bit more connected to reality than the other two forties books. Yeah, it was it, that I, I thoroughly enjoyed that story. I thought that was good. Uh, you know, I, I like that. I like the Batman story. I that was that was good. Um, yeah, I think, you know, maybe not now, but we probably need to read some 70s Batman. The post, the, was good. the post yeah. Adam West, Silver Age, 70s yeah, Batman, yeah. With Neil Adams art. And mm -hmm. I just haven't read a lot of it uh, ever. Uh, I think that would be a fun thing. I think the Sandman stuff would be fun to go back and, and yeah. read. Obviously, somehow any Joe Orlando edited piece, you know, mm -hmm. the House of Mystery, House of Secrets, yeah. Spectre and Showcase, uh, any mm -hmm. of that stuff. Could be a lot of fun. Uh, I I mean, if you go back and read the Superman stuff, you read it because it's the Superman stuff and you know what you're getting. Mm -hmm. Man, that Wonder Woman stuff. Oof. I, um, I, it was a... I, I could see why Wonder Woman wouldn't take off as a character as well as some of the other characters did. Yeah, yeah. It's an interest, it was a, it, it, it was interesting. I, yeah, I, I mean, if, if I like a, uh, if I'm, if I'm going to be honest, uh, the early Wonder Woman stuff, I mean, it's, it's not my particular cup of tea. The, uh, the Perez Wonder Woman stuff, uh, is definitely it, uh, when it comes to Wonder Woman, but you know, that's me. <laughs> well, and like you said, you can watch, uh, Marston and his Wonder Woman if you want some more of the backstory on that. Um, I, you know, to me, with the backstory, um, 
makes it worse. Um, yeah, because knowing because, the backstory, I'm like, I think this could have been done a lot better. Well, once you read, once you know the backstory, then you start to look at everything and you start to critique it as to why. And then you're like, oh wow, oh oh wow. Then you start so maybe feel, knowing the backstory hurts me on those. It, really yeah, because then you start to feel yeah. kind of gross. Yeah, it felt really yeah. gross reading it. Yeah, it so, did not feel great. That's it did not I, feel like Christmas. As a kid, as a kid, I'll say when I was a kid reading this, reading the old Wonder Woman stuff, I was like, "Oh, it's Wonder Woman. Okay, cool. Okay, um, she's fighting bad guys. Okay." And then you become older, you become educated on certain things, and you're like, oh, "It takes the it 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 takes the, the wind out of the sails of that, and it makes it gross." And then you read the Perez stuff, and it brings it back to something good again. Yeah, and like we're not throwing shade at anybody that chooses certain lifestyle choices. It's just the way the book was used. To, uh, my issue yeah. is not the lifestyle choices it's not at the, all. Yeah, it's not Mine the, is the way choice. that women that a woman is portrayed Perceived. in the book. Like yeah. the whole line of the whole line of like I'm bound here, or I'm I like I'm powerless. She doesn't say powerless, but basically I'm powerless because I was bound by a man I trusted. Yeah. That's that's the gross part to me. That's it, I, that, that's gross. I'm yeah. That's the gross part to me. It's not like if people want to find each other, I don't give a shit about that. The gross the gross part of the line is the submission of her in the book and the the submissive position of women in the story, right? I, I think it's especially well, and the 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 abuse piece was gross too. Like I didn't like that yeah. at all. Well, for me, it's like. It's it's like you can if if that's your thing, if that's what you like, that's cool and do that. But when it comes to like, I mean, when you're putting it out there for, you know, in art and stuff like that. And I guess in in art, that's going to be in this case, this is like, hey, I'm making this art and it's I want it to be uh, digested by children. <laughs> yeah. And. And I want I want kids to read this stuff and I'm going to put it out there like this. And what I'm my cup of tea is for this stuff in my life is this. And then I'm going to put it on the page and I want it to be done this way because that's what I enjoy. Um, And then it's put out there and then it's like, oh, and we weren't reading some of the other books, so maybe there's like references to like the lasso and the the mythos. Yeah. Like, so I, again, I, I I will I will I'm not going to withhold judgment, but I'm going to also say maybe maybe there are things in the other books that explain like how the lasso work and explain yeah. the why, like from the Greek mythology mythos pieces and stuff like that. So perhaps, but I since we're reading like a single issue, and that's what we may- got. It just made for a lot of tying up during the Christmas episode of Christmas issue. <laughs> it made a lot of time. Well, and I want to go back to it's it's the general way women were presented throughout the book. Right. Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. the the yeah. mom slash wife is powerless. She's putting um, she's, she's putting always putting being held over by bad men. Situations. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's and, just it's cringy all the way through. Yeah. So, so it's tough for you. <laughs> yeah. Not my favorite, but the other ones that they were fine. I mean, the Superman story was boring. I mean, it was just it was there. What are you talking about? It made you question everything. No, it really didn't. It was it was badly written. It was it was a terrible it was a typical Jerry Siegel story. It was terribly written. Um, it, it was targeted it been, at kids. So I hope kids got it. Uh, but it there's no consistency great. to the story. It doesn't make a lot of sense. It would have been great to be done on the radio. And we also, you know, for critiquing the Wonder Woman story, by the way, there was a lot of bound up women in the Jerry Siegel story, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that both of them were products of their time. Yeah. So, yeah. Help us. And, you know, I guess that's where I mean, I guess that's why people are still talking about Joe, Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. Uh, Jerry Siegel is known for creating Superman. And mm-hmm. I outside of the movie, I don't think William Molden Martian's getting a crap ton of like respect in the comic industry as a great writer yeah it's uh it's it's interesting <laughs> yeah and the batman I, story is great and yeah there we go i i i thank you so much for bringing this to to us to read today dan i am so, You're so welcome i'm so glad that you i can feel the genuine I, no i i liked 
70 percent of it (laughs) (laughs) well this is one of the ones where we pull it out of the long box and we read it and they can't always be good that's right that's right and this one when you when you get it you get an anthology book aha some of it's gonna be good and some of it's not so it's okay it, it's like it's like so it's used like to that. say two out of three ain't bad. I think Meatloaf said that. Oh, okay, well, <laughs> it's so used to say it all the time too. <laughs> I think Meatloaf said that. Okay. Well, we should probably wrap this one up. Uh, it's, it's 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 it is that time of the year. It's the holiday season. We just read a Christmas issue, so uh, this one you should be getting right after christmas on the 27th so Just sorry like we didn't thing. hit you up we wanted to give you the present of alpha dogs right before christmas and we'll give yeah. you this present right after christmas uh i guess i know absolute zeros you can mention that yeah absolute zeros um go put your orders in uh at your your bookstores comic book stores uh pre-orders on the internet through your your book purchasing services uh through your online bookstores or wherever you get your books. Um, you can go and grab the link that Dan will put up on the on the page for that. And, uh, yeah, check it out. Absolute Zero's Camp Launchpad. Uh, it's a book that Mike Tanner and I wrote about three kids going to summer camp at a space camp. Uh, Gabriel Gomez does the art, and Little Brown and Ian Horn Epic Productions have put together and are putting out for us. And give Greg a Christmas present by pre-ordering that book. If you pre-order that book in the hardbound version, you will get a copy of an MXPX CD, and your book will smell like vanilla flavoring. Thank you, Vanilla Cupcake, for bringing that to us. And we really appreciate your patronage there. There we go. See? It's perfect. (laughs) And I can't wait to see Greg again because I have a thing for him, which I will just wave across the camera over and over again so he can't see it, and then put it back. Oh, yeah. And uh, yet we will we will reveal not on the 20, not on this podcast, but on the next podcast. Also, uh, I have some network announcements. It's just one. Oh. So what I can tell you, we, we, of course, know that in 2024, we la- announced last week that yes. Nerds from the Crypt will be coming back in 2024. Yes. And I can announce this week that huh? it's very likely huh? that you will get maybe not a ton. But it's very likely you will get episodes of Narrative Gunslingers back <gasps> in 2024. Oh, my goodness. And maybe. Yeah, it's just this is this is maybe we're still in negotiating with the fine Travis Webb here. Yeah. But maybe if Craig is unavailable, I will bravely step in for Greg. Oh, my. And I will listen to Travis talk for an hour. Oh, my goodness. Did you just steal my 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 seat on the podcast? I've not stolen your seat. This this was we were uh, we're in negotiations, I believe. If Greg, if you just happen to be unavailable yeah, and yeah. I need to say, say you wanted to release one a month, but you uh-huh. couldn't do it that month. Then yeah, maybe yeah. there are times when I could step in and I can be the grounding of the podcast, apparently. Yeah, no, because I, if, if anybody uh, that listens to our show um, here uh, you get you get me as the as the the color commentary uh, on this show uh, on on narrative gunslingers. I am I am the Dan of the narrative gunslingers, where Travis is the the me uh, of that show, where he is off the rails. <laughs> well, so good news then. Yeah. I would be in charge of keeping Travis on the rails, which. On the rails. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a daunting task, but uh, maybe we're up to challenge. So good news. Uh, good news, friends. Uh, we should have a few more podcasts uh, heading back. Uh, and, and so check those feeds. If you've got the the feed should not have changed. So if you have the Narrative Gunslingers feed already uh, and if you have the Nerds from the Crypt feed already, look out for new episodes of those in 2024. And as we get closer to finding out when those are exactly come out, we will update you. But I told you. Each week, Greg, a little bit, a little bit of knowledge. Is this what happens people when I, I hanging go to Las Vegas with seat. you and you go and talk to Travis without me? Yes, these things happen. Oh, my gosh, people. I Dan's can also negotiate snake. and talk. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's hard to believe that I can actually talk to people. It's <laughs> you sneaky Devastatingly snake. difficult. He's a snake. I would call me a snake. I believe I was helping. I know. A snake, I know a snake <laughs> implies I was in the Wonder Woman story. And a helper implies that I was in the Batman story. 
Okay, okay. So you went, you 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 go, you hang out, you hang out with Travis, you take him to a steakhouse, and then all of a sudden you're announcing that you're gonna co-host the podcast without me. I did not say. <laughs> wait, hold up. I don't think you heard what I said. I believe just, this was. If Greg is unavailable, Dan may be able to step in. Well, on that note. (laughs) Yes, yes. We've given the listeners a little taste of what might come up. Maybe we should just all three do a podcast together. And then I would go insane trying to hold both of you in place. So it could be. But but with that said, I think we should wrap up this one. Uh, You obviously hopefully all know about the Retro Emporium and Meeker Street in Kent, Washington. If you want to see Greg and Ann. Greg is there a lot, except tonight because he's podcasting with me. But you you are seeing him around December and January early season. You're very likely to find him there. Yes. Uh, in addition, uh, we have to mention our good friend, jujitsu lawyer, Paul Boudreau yes. and his uh, his studio studio. Jim studio. Gym. I call it a studio. It's, a, it's a, a studio studio Where gym. They, they, I don't know. We'll just call it that. Yeah, uh, you can they, they wrestle up certified martial arts on Bridgeport Way and 27th in Tacoma slash University Place, Washington. If you are in the area and you want to learn jujitsu, go see Paul. And if you see. want a will, you can also go see Paul. So like me, you could, you, yeah, you I've, get it done. Let's say you just woke up this morning. And you're like, I wish I had a will and I wish I knew how to choke somebody out. Yeah. You could go to certified martial arts. Why not do both? Yeah. Get a will, yeah. learn to choke somebody out. Well, learn learn jujitsu and then ask for an appointment with yeah. to to have your will written. Yes. Yeah, there you go. He could do both. Yeah. Yeah. How how many other places in the world can you go to get both of those things done? At the Not same many. Time? I mean See? I mean, last time I asked for something like that, they're like, Excuse me, sir, this is a Wendy's. Yeah. And, and <laughs> Yeah, that it, it, you were probably in the drive through too. So I was. I was. Uh, well, your frosty and your five piece nugget are going to be two thirty seven, sir. And your will, we don't do here. We don't do that. And I can choke you out in the back or in the back if you want. But whoa, that is <laughs> a weird Wendy's. And on that note, I think it's a fine time to end the podcast. So. <laughs> yeah.